it's noon here in New Haven. So we see that we have many of you signing in. in. So welcome to a new global Immunotalk. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all of you joining us across the world. Uh, we are very excited uh, about our talk today. And I'll just say very briefly that uh, to me is extra special as our speaker today, Sue Kaek and I, we are colleagues at Yale Immunobiology for about a decade. Uh, I admire Sue and I have learned a lot from Sue over the years and I have missed her dearly since he moved to Salk. Uh, but we have remained very close colleagues and I very much look forward to her talk. I would like now to introduce my friend and co-host Elina Zuniga from UCSD, who will remind us briefly about the goals of this series and will introduce Sue. Thank you, Elina. Thank you, Carly. Uh, yes, just uh, briefly. Uh, First, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us again. And uh, a reminder that uh, the goals for the Global Immuno Talks are to benefit and inspire immunologists across the world in an egalitarian manner, and also to increase opportunities for scientific learning without traveling. And so uh, one more time, we would like to thank the uh, speakers uh, who has, uh, have made this initiative uh, possible. And also thank all of you that have uh, decided to be part of this initiative, not only by joining us every week, but also by spreading the word. Uh, so please keep doing it so more and more can benefit uh, from these amazing speakers that have so much to share. So talking about amazing speakers, I'm uh, delighted to introduce uh, today to Dr. Susan Kaik from the Salk Institute. So Sue has uh, received her bachelor degree from the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, she received her PhD in developmental biology from Stanford University, and then uh, performed a postdoctoral training in the laboratory of Dr. Rafi Ahmed at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And that's when she moved into the immunology field. In 2004, uh, Sue was appointed assistant professor at the Department of Immunobiology at Yale University. And uh, in 2015, she was promoted to, promoted to professor of immunobiology at Yale. Uh, we were lucky that in 2018, as Carla mentioned, uh, a, a Sue was uh, recruited as professor and director of NOMI Center for Immunobiology and Microbial Pathogenesis at the Salk Institute for Biological Sciences here in La Jolla, California. So I can say without hesitation that it has been a delight to have uh, Sue as a neighbor. Uh, she has definitely enlightened our scientific discussions and is, is a fantastic place, person to have uh, around. So, uh, we are all pleased to have uh, Sue in the uh, scientific community here in La Jolla. And so as you know, Sue is a leading authority in the area of effector and memory T cell development. Uh, she has contributed fundamental knowledge to our understanding on how transcription factors and cytokines regulate this process. And she has also contributed to the understanding of T cell exhaustion during chronic infections, and also T-cell regulation in the context of tumors. So all these uh, discovery, cornerstone discoveries that uh, Sue and her team uh, have made uh, to the immunology field are reflected by a number of uh, highly cited uh, scientific publications, as well as a number of honors and awards, uh, like the Bureau Welcome Foundation Award in Biomedical Sciences, and the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Early Career uh, Scientist Award, just uh, to name a couple. So on a personal note, it's a pleasure to have uh, Sue uh, speaking uh, to us today. Uh, we uh, turn out that we are scientific relatives because uh, <laughs> Sue's uh, postdoctoral mentor, Dr. Rafi Ahmed, was one of the first uh, postdoctoral trainees 
uh, with uh, Michael Allstone and the Scripps Research Institute in the 70s, where many years after I performed my postdoctoral training. So uh, I'm lucky and honored to be in the same uh, scientific family tree as Suka. And uh, uh, yeah, we end up being uh, related in that way as well, apart from uh, being uh, uh, great friends. So and Carla, uh, Carla and I might be real cousins. <laughs> Carla and I might be really related. Is yeah. that true? Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah, through our maternal bloodlines. Yeah. We are both Rothlins. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's a small world at the end, right? Uh, yeah. Well, so it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for the effort to be here and, and to present your, your science. And um, so before we start with the talk, as always, we're going to ask the speakers a, a a question that we hope can uh, benefit uh, the young audience that we have for these global immuno talks. And uh, today's question uh, is designed to reflect a little bit that uh, we all make mistakes and we should expect making mistakes. And even the amazing Sukai uh, can make mistakes. And uh, so the question we want to ask you today is that if you could share one mistake that has taught you something uh, during your scientific career. Uh, thank you. And thank, I want to first just thank you guys for doing this. This is such a great organization. And I have a feeling that this is going to continue on even over the years because it is such a great way to, to reach out to, to people. So mistakes. Uh, I, I, I think I've made many. Should I go back to high school and, and my <laughs> friends? Uh, I, um, uh, my dad would my dad would agree that uh, those were those were some mistakes. Uh, I think, but I guess one thing I'm very confident of is that what was not a mistake is to become a scientist and to become an immunologist. I just can't imagine having a different life uh, than being a scientist. So this was definitely uh, the right the right decision for me, despite all the stress we have. Uh, I certainly, I don't have a mistake, like I really wish I had one of those kind of fun stories, like I made, you know, this mistake, I put the wrong reagent in, a, in an experiment and, you know, oh my gosh, you know, I discovered the aha moment and had uh, this major discovery and epiphany. Um, I've had my aha moments, but they weren't, they weren't like that. Uh, I guess mistakes that I've made, I've certainly made my fair share of mistakes that a lot of us learn from on the job, on the spot, being a mentor, uh, you know, learning how to uh, hire people, how to manage people. Um, uh, I don't, I don't know if I have any, you know, if I would say you know, mistakes that made pivots in my career, but I do kind of have a regret, I guess, in, in some ways. Um, and one regret would be that I didn't take either the time or the opportunities, especially when I was in college to um, learn more about uh, medicine. Number one, I kind of wish I would have had more uh, exposure to medicine and clinical knowledge so that I could apply it more today to my research. Um, and, um, and I guess along those lines, just uh, you're, you're so focused on specific aspects of what you have to learn to accomplish your degree or whatnot that I wish I would have taken the time to um, and still can. I guess that's the beauty of our careers is we always are learning. We're never not in school. My kids ask me, what do I do? I go, I go to school. <laughs> I've always been in school. Um, but I wish I would have um, also uh, had the chance to learn more about other fields of science too. Um, and so I think that's a, a, something that um, I, I keep trying to, to do by uh, the research we're doing today. So so not not in a super exciting little story, but yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was very true. That, that's very helpful, Anna. And I like what you said that we can keep learning, and uh, and we are lucky to be in this career for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that, Anna. Uh, so we are ready for your talk, and so we can see your screen, and uh, I, yeah, that's that's perfect. So. Uh, you gotta start whenever you are ready. Yeah. Well, thank you again for for this opportunity. And um, and first, I want to just thank my lab uh, and my past lab members and my current lab members. And this is you know definitely under unusual circumstances. And and I have to say the way that everyone's coming together and working uh, the best that we can to accomplish whatever we can under these circumstances and 
and thinking and all the cooperativity and the collaboration that's going on. People in my lab are helping each other right now with other people's experiments. People are doing things for each other every day to maximize what we can get done under the circumstances. And, and also um, thinking about what we can do for the, the current situation and, and studying COVID-19. So I really wanna thank um, everybody for just being so amazing. And I'm so proud of you. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine being um, in, in these circumstances as, as a trainee at, at this time. And so I just wanna thank you all for, for all you guys are doing. And I thought I would talk about something that is uh, extremely front and center and pertinent to our, our lives every day, but even more as we really think about how we're going to develop a global vaccine. Uh, this is the first time in decades that people have had to um, worry about what their protective immunity, their protective immunity and if they, are immune or, or not to a particular pathogen in a way that is, is, is unprecedented for a lot of the, the current uh, generations in, in our, in, on the globe right now. But of course, uh, this is not a new feeling for a lot of people. Uh, 50, you know, you know, even 30, 40 years ago, there were many important uh, infectious diseases that ravaged society that had you know main, main, major implications on on health and 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 the the um, and the happiness of, of our society and the fear that was brought on by these these pathogens and of course developing the vaccines have have been what really have helped society move forward and as we face this situation right now where we're going to have to identify a global vaccine for for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, I think we'll really uh, hope, hopefully value again the, the, the essential um, elements that vaccination does and bring in health to, to our society. Um, and so we can think about long-term immunity as, as what's going to be the basis for, for these vaccines and the protective immunity that they're going to form. And so just kind of going back in history, when did protective immunity first start to really become um, a, a part of, of our understanding of human health. And, and the first written documentation of, of, of protective immunity and that we can develop long-term immunity was, was, uh, was observed and or at least written down by the Greek historian Thucydides, um, who he noted during the plague of Athens in the early 400 BCs that, that there were people who had, sur had been infected, survived the infection, recovered, and then that they would be able to care for the sick and not experience that same severity of infection uh, again. They would not die, for instance, after they had recovered from that infection, even if they were exposing themselves and caring for, for the sick. And so he, it was quoted that the same man was never attacked twice, never at least fatally. But of course, the, more ex the, the first experimental evidence of long-term immunity came from Edward Jenner uh, doing the first vaccination of, of smallpox by using the cowpox uh, uh, blisters from, from milkmaids and immunizing uh, 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 James Phipps with, with, with this cowpox uh, um, inoculum. And then, and then a few months later, actually testing if he was immune to the cowpox by then inoculating him with smallpox uh, scabs from, from another smallpox victim and, and found that indeed they, that they, this, this little boy was protected. Of course, we couldn't do this today, but this was the first form and the first experimental evidence that one could transfer uh, immunity from, from the, in, the art, in the art of vaccination. And so understanding that how this long-term immunity is formed and what are the cellular and molecular uh, agents that underlie this long-term immunity then of course established uh, uh, the, the field of, of vaccination and in many ways the field of immunology. And so if you can think about what then our immune systems need to do to go from this naive state to this protected state that we have after we, in many cases, after we've had uh, exposure to a pathogen, you can kind of break it down into two simple jobs that our immune system has to do. And the first job is to, to fight the present infection. Uh, and the second job is to fight the future infection because the chances are that you've seen the pathogen once, you're going to see it again. Uh, and probably fairly soon uh, if, if it's circulating in, in the community, such as what we're seeing with SARS-CoV-2. So how are these two jobs performed by our immune system? And what are the cell types that underlie 
this, this protective immunity that, that gives us the ability to provide defenses against future encounters with pathogens. And we know that this lies predominantly in, in four main cell types of our adaptive immune system. There certainly is forms of memory and, 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 and enhanced secondary responses in the innate immune system as well. But more classically and traditionally defined, the adaptive immune system is what harbors this ability to form immunological memory. And the four main cell types that are involved in this are our memory T cells and our memory B cells, which make up the memory B cells that can respond to secondary infections, our plasma cells, which are constitutively secreting out uh, antibody to give us that humoral immunity, that circulating and a pool of antibodies. But then we also have our memory T cells, our memory CD4, and our memory CD8 T cells that I'm gonna talk a lot more about today. And eliciting these these four cell types really is the basis of, of vaccination. And so as we start to think about uh, how we're going to develop uh, robust immunity to, to SARS-CoV-2, we're going to need to think about how these cells are, are being elicited and what are going to be the major determinants of, of protection provided by these cells. So if we think about then how these cells form, we've learned a lot by studying the, the kinetics of immune responses over the course of acute uh, infections, both in, in animals, uh, largely in, in viral or bacterial infectious models, um, but also in humans, where we profiled the immune response longitudinally to, to vaccines such as smallpox and, and to, uh, West, uh, to yellow fever virus. And so when you follow the formation of these cells over the course of the immune response, you can break it up into three different phases. And you can see that the T cells, we start off with a pool of precursor cells that can recognize a virus. And upon getting activated, these cells then expand and undergo the first phase of the expansion in the vector cell differentiation phase. And then following the uh, resolution of that infection, the control of the, that pathogen, in this case a virus, the cells undergo a secondary phase of contraction. And then they enter the third phase of the memory phase, where now the, the pool of memory cells has been formed. And so you can think about then how these two jobs are being done, both to fight the present infection and to uh, enable us to fight future infections during the course of this primary exposure, the first exposure to the pathogen, you can see how the uh, immune system and the immune response accomplishes both of these, these uh, goals or, or does, performs these jobs by, by seeding uh, the, the immune system, by seeding our bodies with these uh, early effector cells, but then also these long-lived memory cells that form after the immune response. And we know that the memory cells that form are quite heterogeneous, and I'm not gonna go too much into detail about the different types of memory cells, but to say that they uh, diversify themselves in the way that they circulate throughout the body, can form even long-term residence in, in different tissues. Virtually every tissue of our body can be inhabited by memory T cells. And you can really see that these memory cell populations, then both by their anatomical uh, uh, diversification and their functional diversification, you can kind of see that how these cells find provide a cooperative defense system to uh, shield us basically from the outside in uh, from pathogens that they should, how they should enter our bodies. And so that they can elicit responses immediately at the site of infection, but also then through the circulating patterns of other types of immune of memory cells can then elicit uh, even more robust secondary, secondary responses. And so I'm not gonna really go into the details of the different types of memory cells, but really focus on uh, what has been one, to me one of the more, uh, most interesting questions for how memory cells form, which is really this life and death decision. It's known that millions of, of viral specific or antigen specific cells will form during the course of this early phase of the, of the infection, but then very, very few of them will go on to survive, only like five to 10%. And this is seen routinely and reproducibly across many different types of infections. And so a very important question then is really what's, the, what's making this decision between the cells that survive and go on to seed the memory pool versus the cells that die. And when I first started in the field, um, actually 20 years ago, uh, this year marks my 20th anniversary from when I started my postdoc in Rafi's lab, um, I was very intrigued by this question in part because it was a complete black box. Uh, we knew the, the kinetics of the response, 
but we really, and we knew the cells that were forming, we could identify them, but we really knew nothing about the signals or the pathways that were leading to the formation of these, of these memory cells. So understanding and, and, and digging into this black box is, is uh, something that I've been doing now for, for 20 years. And I want to take you back in time. I'm going to kind of give you kind of a historical perspective of, of, of how we've kind of walked through a lot of these interesting questions to really uh, decode some of the important uh, elements for how memory CD8 T cells form. I'm going to focus this, uh, this talk on CD8 T cell memory and take you back to where I think the field was when I first uh, entered the field and thinking about how memory cells form. And it was thought that um, as, uh, as these cells expand, uh, there's in, there's, uh, there are survival, there are survival factors that kind of serve as a set point for the number of memory cells that might ex uh, exist in, 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 a, in a host. And it was thought that as these cells get activated and expand, there's infection-induced growth factors like IL-2. Um, but then as these growth factors would start to, as a virus or the pathogen would start to go down, that these infection-induced growth factors would also go down. And that eventually then there, there'd be a competition for all of these T cells that were initially expanded in, in response to the infection and these growth factors, that there then would be a competition as these growth factors started to wane, that there would then be a competition for these T cells to see these survival factors, and that ultimately what would come back to homeostasis would be these survival factors that were necessary for keeping the memory T cells alive. And that the survival of the fittest or this competition for these survival factors is what determined the set point for, it, for the memory T cells that would form. And so this is a very stochastic process suggesting that these cells would then uh, uh, have the ability to give rise to memory, but it was some stochastic competition a survival of the fittest, if you will, for, for those survival factors. And so implicit in this, this model and way of thinking then was that all of these effector cells that were forming were, were essentially equipotent to give rise to the memory pool. They all had the same ability, developmental potential to give rise to that memory pool. But really what was the determinant in this model was that there was a bottleneck of survival factors. In this case, it would be IL-7 and IL-15 predominantly because we know that these are important factors for, for allowing memory T cells to survive. But an equally um, compelling and, and, and viable model is that it's not necessarily that these cells are all equipotent but rather that this population of cells is of mixed fates and that there are some cells that have a better ability to, to go through this bottleneck that are intrinsically more fit uh, to give rise to a memory population. And so this would be a non-equipotent um, a model where there are intrinsic differences between the, the T cells in who can become a memory cell and, and who cannot. And so this is one of the first uh, experiments I actually Went, set off to do in Rafi's lab was to ask this question then, um, does the environment matter? Are there factors being produced during infection that would control the rate at which these, these memory cells formed or the numbers of these memory cells that would form? And so we, using the model um, of LCMV infection, we infected mice and we took these effector cells out at the peak of the expansion, which is about day eight post-infection. And we took this population of viral specific effector cells and then we transferred it either back into a naive animal which would have kind of the set point of survival factors or we put it into an infection match uh, mouse and then we just asked how was the contraction phase different was it different and if you look at then the transfer of the of the t cells of this effector pool into these two different hosts you can see so we started with the day eight effector pool and then we transferred it now we're following this this donor population uh, several weeks after transfer. And what you could see is that regardless if the cells were transferred into a naive host or an infected host, uh, the, or an infection matched host, you saw that the contraction phase was identical between uh, these two environments. And then the numbers of memory cells that went on to form in these, don in these recipient mice was also uh, very similar. And so while this doesn't necessarily 
uh, what this demonstrated was that the environment really didn't have a major influence on the on the numbers of memory cells that formed. And if you if you think about this, what was interesting about this infected host is this: we were transferring in these donor effector cells into an animal that already had millions of, of viral specific cells that they would be then competing with. Whereas in the naive host, the transfer of these effector cells were, were not in that type of environment. There wasn't that type of competition. And so one would have thought that if there was an environmental uh, element or competition, that there could have been perhaps more survival in the naive host as compared to the infected host. But since we didn't see that, and what we really saw was just the same types of kinetics, it made me think that the environment wasn't really as important, perhaps, as, as one might think from the stochastic or equipotent model but that maybe there was already cells that were determined and were intrinsically more fit or specified to give rise to a pool of memory cells. And so to, to examine this further, um, this is going way back. Uh, when uh, I was at Stanford as a PhD student, Pat Brown was just developing the first microarrays and coming into Rafi's lab, Rafi really wanted to apply this type of, of, of um, exper uh, technology to understanding T cells. And I was very excited about this because I had come from my PhD in developmental biology. And I thought, oh, we're going to learn about all these really cool developmental pathways like notch signaling and hedgehog signaling and wind signaling. And we're going to see all these interesting developmental pathways that are going to be involved in the formation of memory cells. And so we went, we set out to do the microarray analysis, looking at the genes, the gene uh, ex expression patterns that changed in these T cells as they differentiated from a naive cell to an effector cell to a memory cell. And I'm just showing you a cartoon here of this where we were able to then identify genes that were more highly expressed in memory cells and those that were more highly expressed at this effector time point. Now we knew that there was going to be a pool of cells in, within this effector pool that was going to give rise to the memory pool. That's what those adoptive transfer experiments showed us. So we reasoned that if there were genes that were more unique to a memory cell than to the effector pool, perhaps we could go back in time and we could longitudinally track backwards when, if any of these effector cells started to express some of these memory genes. And that might then give, give us an ability to distinguish the cells that are starting to become on their way to, to a memory cell. And one of these genes that came out of this screen was the IL-7 receptor. And this was a really fortunate timing because Leo LeFrancois had just, and, and Kim Schlons had just uh, published it a, a year or so before we did this work that there was a, a requirement for IL-7 receptor signaling in the formation of memory cells. So we knew that IL-7 was a very critical, and IL-7 receptor was a very critical survival signal for memory cells. And so we started to then look more closely at the IL-7 receptor expression on these viral specific cells over these different time points of, of infection. And we could see that naive cells start off expressing a lot of IL-7 receptor, but when they get activated, they very rapidly downregulate it as they switch to surviving on other types of, of cytokines and survival factors. And so when you look at the effector pool, you see that the majority of the effector cells have downregulated IL-7 receptor, but there is this small pool of cells that we saw that could express IL-7 receptor. And so we, we, we postulated maybe these cells were already kind of on their way to becoming or being determined or specified to, to give rise to a memory uh, fate. And so we, uh, we isolated these cells to the best that we could by doing sort purifications. And then we transferred these cells and saw that indeed this population of cells did have a better fitness overall uh, compared to the cells that expressed lower levels of IL-7 receptor that they could give rise to the memory pool. Now, there's not, this is not binary, this is not black and white, what we, but what we identified was that there was in, inherently greater fitness to give rise to the memory cells in this population of effector cells expressed higher levels of IL-7 receptor uh, during this early effector phase of, of, the, um, of the infection. And so these cells, we, we refer to them as having increased memory potential because of this ability to persist and, and seed the memory pool after 
after the transition from effector to memory. And so we started to refer to these, uh, these cells that express higher levels of IL-7 receptor as memory precursor cells to distinguish them from the other effector cells that had, in, in, again, intrinsically greater rates but, uh, of, of death and, and, and inability to see the memory pool. But certainly we know that some of these cells, uh, these effector cells, are able to persist over longer periods of time and often are, are found at these, later, at these later time points, many months after infection. We refer to them as longer lived effector cells. So trying to think about then how do, how do T cells um, develop this ability to specify a memory fate. And we know that it has to be highly linked to the specification of the effector fate. And we've learned a lot over the, uh, the last several decades about how T cells are specified to become certain types of effector cells it's for CD4 T cells, a Th1 or a Th2 or a Th17. And so we know that there is important uh, modes, programs are specifying the types of effector cells that form. And, you, and as we said, we can, we can generate many different types of effector cells that form. But thinking about then how is this memory fate also uh, being instilled in these effector cells over the, over at the same time, at the same, in the same, at the same time, I guess, simultaneously with this effector cell specification, we started to think about this as, as almost two layers of differentiation. One layer is the specification of which type of an effector cell to become. But a second layer of specification is then their long-term fates. And will they become a, a specified effector that will persist transiently? Or will they be endowed with this longevity and this memory potential to give rise to, to, the to memory precursors and, and to give rise to future protection? And so we thought perhaps there is going to be specification of effector cells, but the second layer of specification of the long-term fate occurring simultaneously with this effector development um, in, in these cells. So, so when and how then do these memory precursor cells start to form as these effector uh, cells are being specified to the type of effector cell they're going to become? And, and this is uh, uh, one of these moments where it's, it's, it's always great to have papers that really make you think about, um, about things differently. And this was, this was the case with a paper that came out by Bob Cedar uh, that had a very big influence on me. And I, and, I, and, I joke, and I joke with him too that, well, I didn't really like this paper when it came out. Um, I wasn't sure I believed it. It actually, in, in, in high, in, over the years had, had a lot of influence on the way that we thought about uh, the, the ideas that we were formulating, thinking about how memory cells form. And so this paper by Bob um, came out and it had a very simple um, uh, uh, statement. He had identified that CD4 T cells when cultured in vitro uh, for and polarizing them under Th1 conditions, and which is a, a process by which it takes several weeks to to create these highly polarized CD4 uh, Th1 cells, that the cells, if they took the cells that expressed interferon gamma, which they were able to do by using that cytokine capture bead uh, enrichment assay, and then transferred them into mice, they found that the cells that had give, given rise to these uh, Th1 interferon gamma producing cells had, had mainly died when they were transferred in vivo. They weren't really able to persist and give rise to a pool of memory cells in these kind of adoptive transfer experiments. And so that they made them suggest that effector cells essentially could not go on to give rise to memory. But at the same time, there were other really elegant experiments going on by Casey Weaver and, and Laurie Harrington and, and others. And, and we knew from our own work um, in, in LCMV that, that, that was, it wasn't this simple, that there, there are effector cells that form and they can produce cytokines, but we know that they have the capacity to go on to give rise to memory. And this was also suggested by these um, really clever genetic marking of effector cells with reporter um, uh, transgenes. Uh, that also showed that a cell could give rise to an effector state and still go on to give rise to a memory state. So, but this, but this kind of um, made me think a little bit more about the process of how memory precursor cells may form. And, and simultaneously, around the same time that this was happening, there was beautiful work coming out from Federica Salusto identifying, and, and Lanzavecchia identifying the different subsets of cells, and also Nick Restifo and Luca Gattinoni identifying these more stem-like memory cells. But they started to put together these models that just kind of made me very confused. 
they would put together these models like this where they would say a naive T cell gives rise to a, a stem cell memory or a central memory cell or then an effector memory. Then they give rise to an effector cell and then they die. And I was like, what, what is this? They're putting the cart before the horse. We know effector cells form first during infection, then they go on to give rise to memory longitudinally. And so I felt, I felt like the, we were all very confused by a lot of what these different models were trying to put together. And I started to think about this and said, well, maybe we're actually all saying the same thing. And what's really the problem is just the terminology that we're using. And if we just cover up these labels and think about what we're really saying, what we're really saying is that these cells exist in a variety of differentiation states. And perhaps there is a progressive uh, uh, a differentiation program that these T cells can undertake as they are getting activated and differentiated to effector cells. And that there are T cells that can exist in less differentiated states or more differentiated states, or maybe even acquire a more terminally differentiated effector state that then is a part of, of, of losing this memory potential and being um, part of uh, this more transient effector state. And so thinking about that, that helped us to formulate a model of how a, a heterogeneous pool of effector cells could form with, with effector cells acquiring these different differentiation states and that there's a spectrum of states and there's many states that can be formed, but that there is potentially this progressive um, uh, uh, differentiation that goes from a less differentiated to a more terminally differentiated state. And coupled with this, uh, acquisition of a more terminal differentiation state, then our cells are losing uh, quintessential memory hallmarks like longevity, losing the ability to be multipotent, losing the ability to self-renew, having a more reduced proliferative capacity. So all of these features that we think about um, as part of, of being able to mount a secondary response and a robust, robust secondary response with, with a burst and a wave of, of new effector cells, perhaps this is being lost as these, these effector cells become more terminally differentiated. But at the time, as they're becoming more terminally differentiated, they're becoming highly specialized functional effector cells, very important for clearing that present infection, but losing that potential to give rise to memory cells that are needed to fight the future infection. And so we started to think about this and there was already evidence that we knew that there was a heterogeneous pool of effector cells that was forming during the peaks of these uh, immune responses. As we started to add more proteins into our, our flow panels, we could start to see this vast heterogeneity. And this is just a, a cartoon to kind of illustrate some of the heterogeneity that forms. And what this really makes us also, also think about then is if there are different many different types of differentiation states that can form in this effector pool, then really what is the plasticity and the stability of these fates? Are some of these states much more stable, like what we can see in these more terminally differentiated effector cells? Um, but is there also a lot of plasticity that's inherent to these uh, less differentiated cells? Not only is there inherent plasticity because they can, and, and multipotency because they can go on to give rise to memory cells and, and many different types of memory cells, but also that these precursors can, uh, upon seeing a secondary infection, can then give rise to more terminal effector cells. So they're multipotent both in the ways they can give rise to memory, but also secondary effector cells. And so understanding then the, the, the plasticity that might exist within these differentiation states is going to be an important um, uh, for our field as we move forward uh, to really understand the true heterogeneity of these effector pools. Because as we're learning from the single cell studies that are being conducted now, we know that this heterogeneity is even more vast than we had previously realized. And this is just a beautiful paper that came out from Ananda Goldrath and, and John Chang's lab. Uh, doing single cell analysis over the time course of, of LCMV infection and really starting to illustrate and elucidate this, this heterogeneity that we're going to be um, uh, trying to understand uh, in years to come. So how is a spectrum of differentiation states generated then in this pool? How do you give, give rise to many different types of, of, of differentiation states? And there's been a lot of work over the years that um, really beautiful work. And this is some of my favorite work that came out about six to seven, uh, maybe even eight years ago now, where people started to transfer single cells, single precursors, and ask what types of effector cells they were capable of giving rise to. And what was found um, from Tom Schumacher and Dirk Bush uh, was that as the effector cells expand, 
uh, the size as shown here, the size of that clone, so each clone, each cell that expands uh, it and gives rise to its clonal daughter cells, the size of that clone um, was uh, correlating with the extent to how much these cells differentiated and how, how much they became some of these terminally differentiated effector cells. And so you can see here by looking at the marker KLRG1, which helps to identify some of these terminally differentiated effector cells, that the cells that divided the most and gave rise to the biggest clones were also those cells that had a higher enrichment and frequency of these KLRG1 positive terminally differentiated terminal effector cells. And then this other study by Leo LeFrancois, I think this was actually his last study that came out of his lab, is just a beautiful study uh, where they again transferred single precursor cells for a different, for in this case for OVA, uh, and then they looked at the, for how each of these precursor clones gave rise to a population of effector cells either with BSV OVA or with Listeria ova. And what was also shown in this, in this study, and, and Mark Jenkins had done something similar for CD4 T cells, was they observed that a single clone would give rise to a heterogeneous pool of effector cells. Here, the colors are a little bit different. The memory precursor cells that express IL-7 receptor are shown here in, in purple, and the cells that have low levels of IL-7 receptor in this more terminally differentiated marker, KLRG1, are shown here in blue. But what you could see is that each of these clones, which is each, each of these stacked bar, bars represent an individual T cell clone. What you can see is that these clones gave rise to hetero, heterogeneous populations of, of, of daughter cells. And so you could see one cell could give rise to all of these different types of fates. But what was also evident in the study uh, very nicely showed this was that the environment still mattered. So if they looked at the clonal um, uh, heterogeneity that arose, say, in a VSV OVA infection or a Listeria infection, you could see that there was um, uh, alterations in the overall frequency of whether or not the cells uh, adopted more of a, a terminal effector-like phenotype or if it ad adopted more of a memory precursor-like phenotype uh, based on the, the type of infection that those cells were experiencing. So there was differences in the environment that were then influencing the heterogeneity. So one cell could give rise uh, was plastic and could give rise to multiple types of effector cells, but the environment was also influencing the degree to which uh, those daughter cells would take on various types of differentiation states. And so there's many models that we've talked about as a field to account for this heterogeneity that can arise during these early activation states of the, of the T cells. One is the asymmetric uh, so division model uh, that Steve Reiner and John Ching put forth originally, where you could see this asymmetric partitioning of cell fate determinants. And also in, in line with that are, are in other ways in which models that have incorporated the, the strength of signal or the, in the way in which a T cell accumulates more and more encounters with its environment with antigen or inflammatory mediators that influence effector cell differentiation, and that the cell is, is a collection, is a, the, the outcome of the differentiation state is essentially a collection of, of these different encounters that the T cell has had with, uh, with these environmental factors. And so the um, amount of, of, say, antigen or, or inflammatory cytokines that the cell might see could also influence then the differentiation state that that cell took on. What I, what I like about, uh, and, and I think what, we're, what we see when we study this process is that all of these things are happening um, in, in the course of the immune response. And what I, what I like about these models is that they allow us a way to, to think about how the environment uh, can give rise, how, how the, the T cells are differentiating in response to the environment. It allows them to have this flexibility to formulate the types of effector cells that might be best needed and best suited in response to the type of an infection or the inflammatory environment by which those cells are responding to. So there's a lot of flexibility by conditioning of the environment into the types of effector cells that form. So coming back to this model then, how you can specify an effector cell to give rise to a certain type of cell, but also simultaneously specify the long-term fate of that cell. How, how could this process be molecularly controlled and, and how is this happening within this population of effector cells? And so we started to think about the actual 
lineage specifying factors that had been uh, uh, already started to be described, especially in CD4 T cells for polarizing CD4 T cells to Th1 cells or to, to Th2 cells or to Th17 cells. And thinking about CD8 T cells and the cytotoxic potential that um, that they develop as, as they differentiate into their effector cells, key transcription factors like eumesodermin and TBET were identified to be these important regulators of, of cytotoxic cell fate. And so we started to think about TBET in particular because we knew that TBET was um, uh, integrated the environment, again, the, con the signals that came from the environment, the inflammatory mediators, TBET integrated those and was induced by those. And so we started to think about how the cells might be listening to their environment and the signals they're receiving, inducing these uh, effector specification transcription factors like TBET or eumesodermin, but that this, the, the environmental influence on the amount of TBET that was being produced in these cells might then have an influence not only on specifying the type of effector cell that forms, in this case a cytotoxic T cell, but also maybe the amount of TBET that was induced in these cells would also then be involved in specifying this long-term fate, this memory potential. And so again, we started to think about this and, and Bob Cedar's paper came back to me as a way that might be uh, interesting for how we could understand both the results that he observed and how, how uh, these transcription factors that specify cell fate might actually be involved in um, regulating this, this uh, terminal differentiation or memory cell potential. And in fact, coming back to the way that they did these experiments by polarizing these CD4 T cells for several weeks, they were you know, activating them over and over again to, to, be, to, to cause them to differentiate into these highly polarized Th1 cells that perhaps what they were doing in essence was driving these CD4 T cells to this terminally differentiated state. And so it wasn't so much that these cells produced interferon gamma or didn't, and that was a, de de that a determinant of whether or not they could give rise to memory, but rather it was that in these experiments, they had driven these cells to a more terminally differentiated state because of the way that they stimulated them repeatedly for several weeks under highly polarizing conditions with cytokines like IL-12 and, and interferon gamma. So this really started to make us think about, could there be uh, a manner by which the cells were determining uh, how they were going to differentiate and if they could acquire more terminally differentiated states in response to environmental factors like the uh, cytokines that drive TBET like interferon gamma or IL-12. And so we started to do this experiment and this was worked by Nick Joshi and, and Wego uh, Tui at the, who was in the lab at the time uh, where we started to ask this question. And one way that we did that was by trying to immunize mice with peptide pulse dendritic cells to keep the uh, activation of the T cells somewhat constant, uh, but to give um, uh, them a bystander inflammatory signal that would then um, influence the amount of inflammation that was in the environment. And we did this by giving different doses of listeria, such as a low dose or, or, or no listeria at all, just the dendritic cell vaccine, uh, but also then high, low doses of infection, and then we go up and up with different doses of listeria. And what we would see was that the amount of inflammation that was produced by this bystander listeria infection could then influence the types of effector cells that were forming, and that some of these cells would give rise to these more terminally differentiated effector-like cells upon exposure to the highest amount of inflammation. And if we fast forward, we went uh, into looking more closely at how this would regulate TBET levels and found that there was a difference in TBET expression levels in these cells that expressed higher levels of IL-7 receptor versus lower levels of IL-7 receptor and saw that TBET levels were actually lower in these cells that had more memory cell potential. Um, and then we went on to show that the amount of TBET that these cells had, if you even decrease the copy number by one, you could interfere with the progression of these cells to this more terminally differentiated state. And that cells that only had one copy of TBET 
were uh, unable to achieve this terminally differentiated state to the same level as their wild type counterparts. And cells that had no TBET were actually greatly impaired in their ability to achieve this. But what was important is that even though these cells didn't express TBET, they actually were still compromised. And so while they formed cells that looked like memory precursor cells, they still needed some TBET because in the absence of TBET altogether, there was very poor and low levels of expression of IL-15 receptor or CD122. And so this graded amount of TBET was important. It wasn't that TBET was just important for forming these terminally differentiated effector cells, but this low level of TBET was actually important for allowing memory precursor cells to form and to give rise to the most fittest memory precursor cells that could then survive and respond to, to IL-15. And so this provided us a model then that the way in which the spectrum of differentiation states was being, was being achieved within this effector pool was in part due to the elicitation, the exposure to various types of inflammatory mediators in the environment that in turn could then influence the amount of the lineage specifying transcription factors that these cells express and that the amount of these factors, these transcription factors, could set up transcriptional programs that would drive cells to a more terminally differentiated state, such as in higher levels of TBET, or cells that had lower levels of TBET would have more memory cell potential while still in, in, in enjoying the benefits of, be, of being specified to become uh, effector cells. And so we went on to look at this in other types of cell fate decisions, and we found that similarly you could find uh, gradients of TBET that were involved in the decisions of making tissue resident memory cells or effector memory cells, and also in CD4 cells for making T follicular helper cells and TH1 cells. And so this idea that there are graded levels of expression of these transcription factors has been now something that's been illustrated uh, throughout many different studies and, and many people in the field have started to contribute to our understanding and elucidation of the types of, of genetic pathways and the transcription factors that regulate the process of forming these heterogeneous pools of effector cells. In fact, I've, I've referred to the, the last decade or so of, of the field as being the molecular dawn of understanding uh, memory uh, CD8 T cell differentiation and, and beautiful work by many groups, in, including Ananda, um, Steve Hedrick, um, Howie Zhu, there's just been several people that have contributed to our understanding of the types of transcription factors that can, are involved in this process of specifying these effector fates. And what you can really see is that these, pro these develop uh, somewhat co opposing uh, transcriptional programs to allow for the uh, alternative fates to form, but that the degree by which these uh, transcription factors are being expressed or, or various other modes of regulation of their activity can then lead to all the diverse types of states that can arise. And understanding this is actually really, uh, to me, the, the forefront of the field is how do these factors then, now that we're starting to get kind of a, a playbook of the factors that are involved, but how are they now cooperating and regulating one another's activity to give rise to these diverse types of states. And certainly we've identified some of the genes expression signatures that are distinct between a terminal effector cell and a memory precursor cell. And, and, but now we need to understand more about how these intermediate types of differentiation states are able to arise and, and, and what's controlling these cells and, and, and their stability. There seems to be a lot of dynamic plasticity within these cells also that have kind of more intermediate types of differentiation states. And so how is that being controlled? How is that plasticity being controlled? And I just want to talk about a little bit about how this could apply to other types of, of T cell differentiation and memory programs, uh, such as what's been observed in TH1 or TH2 or TH17. It'll be interesting to see if a similar type of a model uh, exists where in this lineage specifying transcription factors not only dictate the type of T cells, the effector cells that form, but then maybe their level of activity or expression will also then modulate the underlying fate, the long-term fate of these cells to give rise to memory cells or to effector cells. And I think this will be interesting to see over the years to come. Now I'm running a little bit uh, behind and so I'm going to uh, try to go through uh, a little bit more um, and, and I'll probably not be able to finish the, the whole talk, but I will um, uh, try to get through uh, the next section. Uh, so another big question then that we had is, are there signals that promote memory cell potential? Uh, we know that IL-7 and IL-15 are essential for the survival of the memory cells, but what all influences the, this, the 
uh, ability of these, mem of these effector cells to maintain memory potential. In other words, how do they avoid not seeing these inflammatory mediators that drive uh, effector and terminal effector differentiation? How are these precursor cells then uh, uh, insensitive or resistant or somehow shielded from the exposure to these factors that drive terminal differentiation? And our work started to think about various factors that are downstream or up, that are upstream of STAT3 that could be involved in this process. And our, and our work started to uncover roles for IL-10 and IL-21 and in, in acting as insulators, if you will, to, to shield the cells from responding to inflammatory mediators like IL-12 or type 1 interferons. And by inducing uh, its, uh, uh, repressors of cytokine signaling, uh, they were able to somehow insulate these cells from seeing or responding to these inflammatory signals like IL-12 or type 1 interferons. And that could then help to maintain or preserve this memory cell potential in these effector cells. And what I really thought was interesting about this is it was somewhat counterintuitive because we usually think of IL-10 as being a uh, anti-inflammatory mediator or immunosuppressive mediator. But what I really think this helped to um, elucidate was the potential paradigm that there are in a balance between the inflammatory and the anti-inflammatory mediators that are the cells are being exposed to during the initial course of infection that's regulating then their differentiation states and the extent to how far they will differentiate during an infection and that having anti-inflammatory uh, checkpoints or, or regulators is actually really important to su sustain and protect and preserve these, these more plastic uh, and the multipotency of these effector cells that can give rise to, to seed the memory pool. And so we've been trying to understand more about how IL-10 is operating in this way. And through a series of studies uh, by Brian Laidlaw in the lab, if we tried to deduce when IL-10 was acting to help to, to maintain and, and, and promote memory, mature memory cells to form. We actually found that IL-10 was acting, interestingly, predominantly during this resolution phase. So blocking IL-10 early or blocking IL-10 late didn't really have much of an impact on this effector to memory transition. But when we blocked IL-10 during this uh, resolution phase, during the contraction phase, what we saw was that the, the memory cells that formed had a lot more of these terminal effector cells uh, in the pool. So this ability to transition to a more mature memory pool was, was uh, dependent on having IL-10 present, but having IL-10 present during this, this resolution phase and when we looked at the cell types that were producing IL-10 during this resolution phase, we found that regulatory T cells were the more dominant cell type. And then upon deleting IL-10 from the regulatory T cells, we were able to show that the provision of IL-10 by regulatory T cells was really important for allowing this, this maturation of these precursor cells to occur to give rise to a more mature and protective pool of circulating memory cells. And so what this suggested to us then was that regulatory T cells not only serve as a role to, to regulate the activation and the, and the regulation of effector functions of, of T cells uh, as, and, and to dampen down and, and maintain and suppress inflammation, but they also play a secondary role in promoting, as, as we are starting to uh, learn uh, uh, over several years, that they also play an important role in tissue homeostasis and repair, but they also can play an important role in um, forming and, and enhancing the formation of memory cells. And I just want to show this really beautiful, uh, very preliminary, but beautiful work by a postdoc in the lab, Yammer uh, Farsakoglu, who is also looking at where these IL-10 niches are forming within uh, in tissues to understand how this um, factor is controlling memory cells. And so looking at the contraction phase, let's see if I can start this. There we go. This is a light sheet microscopy looking at IL-10 in green, uh, the T cells responding to LCMV in red, and then blood vessels here in this kind of bluish purple. And you can start to see through this uh, 3D imaging, we can see during the resolution phase now where IL-10 is being produced and how that's uh, being uh, concentrated around the effector cells within these tissues and to better understand how these, these niches are, are regulating the, the formation of the, the effector pool that will then go on to give rise to, to the memory pool. 
And so this is just my, my humorous intermission. Uh, we've been playing lab trivia over the last several weeks try, uh, as we've been quarantined. And uh, this is our, uh, my, my uh, uh, staff scientist, Hubert, uh, he made this as our, our uh, poster for one of our lab trivia nights. Uh, I don't know if you can tell who, who these are, if you guys have been uh, also binge watching Netflix, yeah, you might know that this is from the Tiger King. And so I'm just going to end very quickly. I'm, I know I'm running out of time. I'm just going to end very quickly with one uh, final uh, uh, story that I thought was very um, interesting for us understanding more about this idea of how do you then maintain memory cell potential and multipotency in the effector cells? Or conversely, how do these effector cells lose memory cell potential as they terminally differentiate? And this was a, a, a very nice study that was done by, by four, collectively by four different graduate students in the lab um, that I referred to as my, as my memory precursor cells. And, and again, we had identified a lot of the transcriptional uh, differences that existed between these uh, effector cells that were terminally differentiated, these terminal effector cells, versus these memory precursor cells. But what we didn't understand was the underlying epigenetic changes that were associated with the formation of these differentiation states. And so we started to do that by doing CHIP-seq, looking at active histone uh, marks, uh, H3K27 acylation, and, and trimethylation, the repressive mark. And so we isolated these memory precursor cells and these terminal effector cells uh, during LCMV infection. And then we looked by CHIP-seq at the, at the deposition of these histone modifications on these cells. And what we wanted to do was compare the epigenetic marks, the differentially modified regions between a terminal effector cell and a memory precursor cell. And so what we show here on this graph is, is histone acetylation. So we're looking at the activation mark. And what we're showing also on this is on the x-axis is the memory precursors versus the terminal effector cells. So all the genes that are shown here as circles on the right side of the plot are genes that have more acetylation in memory precursor cells. And what's shown here on the left side of the plot are genes that have more acetylation in terminal effectors. Now, every dot that's labeled red or blue, is that's indicating if it's a signature gene, that means it's more highly expressed in the memory precursor cells versus the terminal effector cells. And what you can see here, as one would predict, is that cells that have greater levels of acetylation in memory precursor cells also are genes that tend to be more highly expressed in memory precursor cells. So you see the red genes on the memory precursor side, and you see the blue genes conversely on the, the terminal effector side. So these are genes that are more highly expressed in terminal effector cells, and that's associated with greater rates of, of histone acetylation. <clears throat> I just want to point out that the majority of genes and loci are not differential between uh, memory precursors and terminal effectors. In fact, they have much more similarity than diversity, and these are just the, the few regions of differentially modif modified regions that we could identify by histone acetylation. But then if you looked at the repressive mark, uh, H3K27 trimethylation, we saw a different pattern. What we saw was that there was a predominance and enrichment of greater amounts of deposition of H3K27 in terminal effector cells versus memory precursor cells. So at these loci, not at all the loci, most of the loci again are very comparable, but some loci we found were, had greater rates of deposition of this repressive mark at these loci. And when you looked at what those loci were, what you could see was this high degree of enrichment of genes that are normally expressed in memory precursor cells. So what this suggested to us was that as terminal effector cells were differentiating, they were selectively repressing by adding greater amounts of H3K27 trimethylation. They were selectively repressing uh, the genes that are normally associated with memory uh, precursor uh, fates and that they were, they were suppressing and, and selectively silencing these pro-memory genes in these terminal effector cells as they were forming. And so that was suggesting to us that these memory precursor genes that are preferentially being repressed epigenetically uh, via at least one of these uh, uh, histone modifications, H3K27 trimethylation, in terminal effector cells. And to summarize all of this work, what we saw then was that as these naive CDAT cells differentiate into terminal effector cells, we saw kind of the classic pattern of what has been observed, say, in stem cells, as stem cells differentiate into to, to new and acquire new lineages. We saw that these terminal effector cells were turning on 
the genes that are associated with terminal effector cell identity. But what they were doing was they were silencing these, these pro-memory genes, these genes that were normally found in memory precursor cells. But in contrast, we did not see the converse when we looked at the memory precursor cells. What we saw was that these memory precursor cells, while they did turn on their pro-memory genes that were associated with this, that with being a memory precursor cell, they did not repress these genes that are associated with a terminal effector state. It's not that they weren't being transcribed, that they're not transcribing them, but they didn't repress them and, cl and close them down like the terminal effector cells did to the, to the memory precursor genes. Rather, they left these, these genes that are associated with terminal effector states open, but they just weren't transcribing them. And so we, we, what was really interesting about this is that you could see both the loss of memory cell potential in the terminal effector cells at a molecular level by having them restrict and repress these genes associated with memory fates. But conversely, you also could see this intrinsic epigenetic plasticity in the memory precursor cells because they were maintaining expression of their pro-memory genes, but they also maintained the terminal effector genes in an open state, a poised state that could then be turned on or induced if these cells were, were reactivated. And so what we were also interested in understanding is in how the kinetics of these epigenetic changes were occurring as these cells were committing to these different fates. And this was also very interesting and quite surprising to us because what we found was that the, the, by looking at the enzyme that's responsible for adding this H3K27 trimethylation, the EZH2, the catalytic enzyme that's part of the PRC2 complex, what we saw was that if you looked at the early effector cells that formed, they were still able to repress, transcriptionally repress, many of these pro-memory genes such as TCF7, ID3, FOX01. So this immediate early transcriptional repression that was occurring in these early activated effector cells, this is looking at day four and a half, this did not depend on the actual deposition of this H3K27 trimethylation because this was happening either with or without EZH2. But then when we looked at where and when this methylation was being deposited on these effector cells, we saw a very interesting pattern. And if you looked again at these early effector cells, in this case, we're looking at the locus for TCF7 or for BAC2. If you looked at these early effector cells, either one and a half days after activation, where we know that there's already a transcriptional repression going on of TCF7, or if you looked at these day four and a half pre, uh, effector cells, either even, even those that were KLRG1 high already that were starting to acquire this more terminally, uh, terminal effector like state, you didn't really see a greater deposition of the H3K27 mark on this locus. It wasn't until day 10, or at least sometime after day five, that we started to see this, this more um, accumulation and enrichment of this repressive mark on this locus in specifically in these terminally differentiated effector cells. So what this suggested to us is that there were kinetics to, to how these cells were, were specifying these transcriptional programs and that you could almost see different phases of, of this occurring. You could break it up into uh, two phases in some ways, or maybe even three phases, where the first phase is a transcriptional commitment where you can start to see, even as the first cell division, as, as John Chang has shown, even as soon as the first cell division, you can start to see some transcriptional commitment of these cells towards becoming more of an effector or a memory-like fate. But as these uh, early effector cells then start to accumulate more differentiation cues towards a terminal differentiation state as shown here in the blue cells, we start to then see a later phase of epigenetic remodeling occurring at these pro-memory loci, specifically to suppress their ability to express those genes. And so you can refer to this phase as an epigenetic determination of these terminal effector fates. They are losing their memory potential as they epigenetically repress these pro-memory genes and thereby uh, re restricting themselves to be becoming these terminally differentiated effector cells. Whereas in converse, the cells that are maintaining more memory potential they, they keep, they turn on and maintain the expression of these pro-memory genes, but they're also poised. They're not restricting these, these uh, effector genes that are associated with terminally differentiated effector fates. They're maintaining an open chromatin state for those, for those genes to allow them to re-express them as if they were to re become reactivated as a memory cell to allow them to elicit this, this memory 
uh, this effector state, the secondary effector state. And so uh, this has been uh, also seen by Sebastian M. Gorina's lab and also Ben Youngblood's, oh no, we've got the planes coming. Ben Youngblood's, uh, and, as when he was a postdoc with Rafi, uh, looking at how there are continual changes in the remodeling of the, of the epigenome of these uh, effector cells as they differentiate into memory cells. And so you can continue to see dynamic changes that are occurring as these cells continue to differentiate to memory cells and becoming in some ways reprogrammed over the, the course of this resolution phase. And so I just want to uh, end here um, by saying I hope you appreciate that we started off about 20 years ago with a black box, uh, but now we're really uh, understanding a lot of the molecular mechanisms by which these cells are forming. And I would argue that CD8 T cells might be one of the best well understood and studied um, uh, cell types in our immune system and have a rich source of, of resources and, and uh, interesting data sets and omics to, to um, really start to understand this complex process. Uh, in a beautiful way. And so with that, I just want to thank um, my lab again for all they do, all the great ideas they have. It's just a, it's just a joy to, to get to listen and to work with you and a privilege to work with you. And of course, all of my collaborators, I don't have time to go into, but I um, want to thank for all of their input along the way. And thank you all for, for coming or for being here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sue. That was a wonderful talk, and thank you for all your contributions to our understanding on effector and memory T cells. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Sue. This was great, spectacular uh, presentation. Um, so, uh, briefly before uh, we end the meeting, I would like to uh, remind everyone um, about the how to proceed for uh, questions. I think that you can see my screen. Screen. Yes. Uh, so uh, just uh, again, three simple steps uh, for questions and answers via Twitter. Uh, please uh, first search for the account Global Immuno Talks. Find the tweet that says ask questions for Dr. Susan Kaik seminar here. And third, reply to that tweet with your questions and mentioning uh, the hashtag Global Immuno and the Twitter account uh, Tissel Logic, that is the Twitter account from Sue's lab and the one that she will use to answer the questions. Um, so thank you again, Sue. It was a pleasure to hear your presentation. Uh, so I hope everybody will join us again next week for another great speaker, Dr. Bali Pulendram from Stanford University. So thank you, everyone, and see you. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Thank you.